Shipke Street, one of the four main streets in the modern city. But you don't have to look too far for reminders of our history. The walls of the city are now a tourist landmark, but they are also a reminder that Londonderry was a trading centre, a port, but most of all, a key strategic defendable fortress in the plantation of Ulster. Of course, the city was a bit different in 1688. The first thing you notice on the old maps is how close the river was to the walls. This is where the Guildhall stands today. But our story starts closer to the east coast. On the 3rd of December 1688, a letter was found on a street in Cumber, County Down. It warned of the imminent massacre of Protestant men, women and children. The letter was immediately copied and sent across the country to warn people. Whilst the magistrates and aldermen of the city debated on what to do, 13 bold apprentices seized the city keys, locked the gates and shut out the encroaching army. So what was the background to this story? And how does it affect those of us who live within the walls and those of us who live without the walls? James II was the king at the time of the siege. His father was a Protestant, but he was a Roman Catholic and he wanted the Catholic Church to have more control in his kingdom. But to stop this from happening, some English noblemen asked the Protestant, William of Orange, who was James's son-in-law, to be king instead. This was the first time in England when the majority of people weren't happy with a ruler, they could bring a new one into power. In a way, just like we do with governments today. But James II was not putting up with being deposed and he promptly raised an army. And so began a long war between William and his father-in-law, James II. Protestants from all over Ulster fled to Londonderry. As it had walls around it, they felt it would be safe. The population of the city jumped from 2,500 to 30,000 people. Inside the walls, people felt like their whole world was shrinking. Many people found they had no water no comforts of any kind, and newcomers often had no houses to live in. Things were very hard. When the town was first under attack by James's men, the governor, Lieutenant Colonel Lundy, made himself so unpopular by constantly advising and begging for capitulation that he eventually had to make his escape over the walls by night and in disguise. So why were the people of Londonderry so keen not to surrender? Well, only 40 years before, there had been a violent 10-year rebellion in Ireland. At this time, about 12,000 of Ulster's 40,000 Protestants were killed. Many were tortured and met their deaths through knives, muskets and pitchforks. So you can imagine their concern. Initially, James fled to France to get back up. He tried to return via Ireland, where he would need to claim the support of his people. Things went well for his soldiers in Kinsale and Dublin, and he's reputed to have slaughtered people in large numbers on his way through Oma. In April 1689, when he arrived at the gates of our city, he expected them to be open for him and for people to surrender. But they didn't. Whilst he sat there on his horse in the rain, his men were shot at with a cannonball. One was even killed. Eventually, James went back to Dublin and his soldiers took over. This is when the siege proper began. There were many battles and skirmishes after that. It was said that St. Columba once prophesied that the Irish would be utterly destroyed in a great fight in a place called Pennybrock, what we call today Pennyburn.
It was to Pennyburn that Colonel Murray sent his men to fight a ferocious bloody battle in which 200 of James's men, including the French General Beaumont, were killed. On May the 6th, the Jacobites captured a windmill which was dangerously close to the city's walls. But on the 7th of May, the defenders won it back again. The Jacobites had dug a trench from the windmill in the grounds of what is now Lumen Christie College, right down to the river, and they shot cannon fire and muskets from here to the walls. Cannon were also fired from Strong's Orchard, which is now Ebrington Barracks, and this was particularly terrifying for the people inside the walls, as it often meant the roofs of their houses went on fire. On the 18th of May, there was a skirmish where the Craigan housing estate is now, and the defenders drove the Jacobites away. There were many attempts at negotiations and brief periods of peace during the siege, but none of these succeeded. Soon, food began to run short. There was no way of getting supplies as the city was surrounded, except on the riverside, but here the besiegers had cut off communication by placing a great boom located between the Colmore Road and Grancha. This was composed of strong cables and logs bound together and stretched tightly from bank to bank. There was a great excitement when Major General Kirk came down the loch with his supply ships, and people were sure they would be saved. But on hearing about the boom and the armed enemies and forts lining the riverbank on both sides, Kirk retreated and moored at Inch Island. For 46 days after this, the townspeople slowly famished. In the end, they were driven to eat horseflesh, dogs, grease and garbage of every kind. Things weren't much better for the Jacobites either. They'd been badly beaten and were themselves short of supplies. One report tells us that on the evening of the 30th of July, when silence, gloom and despair had settled down on the town, the watchers were startled by a bright flash down the river, followed by the roar of artillery, and a hungry multitude, rushing eagerly to the battlements, saw relief approaching. Kirk had at last taken heart and sent four ships with provisions. In spite of the destructive cannon fire from both sides of the river, the ships approached full sail and crashed through the boom, relieving the city. The next day, the Jacobites gave up and marched away. Following these events, William signed the Bill of Rights. Through this, he was recognising that a monarch should only rule by the will of his people, as opposed to the divine right of kings. But it didn't end there. William and James kept fighting. The siege of Londonderry led to one of the most famous battles in our history, the Battle of the Boyne. But that's another story. So whether we are within or without the walls, this great tale is all part of our city and our heritage. <laughs>